Welcome. I'm David Levi Strauss, chair of the MFA program in art writing here at the School of Visual Arts. I first knew about Danielle Jackson's work from Ariella Azule, uh, and then from Ben Davis, who was with us just recently. Um, Ariella's Ariel has given us a number of students for this program. And I got very interested in a piece that Danielle published online last year in Pic and Repicture called The Impact of Photography Amidst the Extinction of the Mass Media. The question she addresses there is, does the new balkanization of image ecosystems with its filter bubbles and narrow casting mean that the very concept of mass communication is becoming obsolete or is already obsolete? Since, as she says, capitalism has developed in new ways that keep people from receiving the same information, we're being divided up into separate and unequal groups that don't see or hear the same things at all. There's no common culture, only microcultures, or the audiences an algorithm defines. This is disastrous for the commons, if you care about the commons. This is Danielle. As many resort to tribalism, people appear incurious about the worlds beyond their subculture. The element of discovery has been replaced by burrowing deeper into the knowledge of the groups one already knows. And she has the data to back this up. And she's very practical about how one might address and adapt to these changes. Danielle Jackson is a critic, researcher, and arts administrator. She was the co-founder and former co-director of the Bronx Documentary Center, the photography gallery and educational space. Formerly, she ran the cultural department at Magnum Photos and has been a mentor at Magnum Foundation's photography and social justice program. She's worked with leading photographers, filmmakers, and cultural institutions to develop projects, partnerships, and initiatives for social impact. Please welcome Danielle Jackson. Gosh, as you were reciting back to me something I wrote a year and a half ago, um, sort of has reinvigorated. It's like my relationship to these ideas keep changing, and because uh, so many of our, so much of technology is changing, uh, and so much of our kind of political circumstances are constantly changing. And it's interesting to think about where I was when I heard that and thought about uh, where I'm thinking about it now. And I'll make a point at the end at a recent realization I had um, around this question, is sort of related to this question. But I thought I would talk to you a bit about um, these ideas and some ideas that I'm sort of scratching at and trying to resolve or figure out how to think through or talk about. So they're really more like uh, some notes that I'm going to share with you. Um, the way that I'm framing it right now is this idea of what is photography in the pluriverse. And uh, I use the term pluriverse um, inspired by the, an anthropologist and design theorist Arturo Escobar, who's written about uh, design in a potential pluriverse. A pluriverse is a world with many different worlds. Um, a lot of my thinking over the last uh, five years has been towards around the year 2050. I think about, I do a lot of work um, training photographers, trying to diversify the field of photography. Uh, the Bronx Documentary Center does a lot of work with uh, very young people, like high school age, entering college, middle school also. Um, so I keep thinking, you know, what is the world going to be like when they're my age, these high school students? What are they going to be living in? I'm perhaps thinking very idealistically and maybe irresponsibly that I'm not thinking about ecological collapse uh, just yet, but thinking if we ride this out, what is the majority minority country going to look like in the United States? How are we going to interact with one another? How are we going to receive information? And I'll just take you through some of my, my thought process. What will be the new demographic majority? And what will be, will there be a mainstream? So first, <laughs> okay, so I uh, received this issue of the New Yorker in my mail one day, uh, and I completely freaked out. This is an anniversary issue of the New Yorker. This is 
a take on the uh, classic image of Eustace Tilly, the dandy that always marks the uh, anniversary issue. And it's created by uh, an artist named Malika Favre. And it's from 2018, and the image is called the Butterfly Effect. Um, the butterfly reflect, reflect uh, excuse me, the butterfly effect refers to um, an idea in chaos theory where a minute change in one localized area can have large effects someplace else. Uh, so when I received this, I was a bit freaked out in my inbox and in my mailbox is, is everyone getting this image or does it just me? Have we gotten so deep into hyper particularized marketing that not everybody is seeing? a black woman with sort of short hair. I was like, this is too uncanny. I had to immediately call and text a number of friends and go on the website just to make sure. I was like, how deep, uh, how, much, how much of my data is actually out there and how, who has accumulated it and how far does this go? So I had a number of reasons to be paranoid. Uh, this is an image that came up when I was actually writing the piece uh, that Levy referred to. Um, this was in, I was saving an image about something totally unrelated, I don't know, in Pinterest and I got these images of many black women with bald heads. And I was like, you've, I don't know, you've got to be kidding me. This is bizarre. So in general, I get recommended a lot of images of black women. Um, this is from Audible. So I already knew that my computer or the internet or whomever knows that I'm black. And uh, it's a very literal way of, of relating and conceiving of identity, right? This is black woman, uh, I don't know her age range like late 20s to mid 30s, I suppose. This is from betterment.com. Um, this is from Intuit. Sometimes I get a black male. This is another one from my student loan provider, the lovely company Navient. Uh, this is another one from Navient. So always like a 30s-ish woman with natural unprocessed hair, right, somehow. So what it makes me think about is I remember in, uh, when I was growing up, I was raised with the ideal of multiculturalism, right? However you feel about that idea, this is what we were raised to think. And that at some point in the future, uh, we, would, we would all be uh, culturally fluid. We would look at each other's cultures and read each other's literature. This was an idea that was very much pushed also when I was beginning college in the late 2000s. And it kind of felt true for my social circles, um, very different from how things feel now, where I encounter a lot of people who are like, I could never possibly understand this other group's experience. This was the complete opposite. So one of the ideals from that time period was that uh, there would be some sort of stage uh, or forum where we all would appear, we would be able to appear in the mainstream and be consuming images of one another. This, all of this is I'm just consuming images. No one, I'm sure no one else is getting these images. Maybe you are, you can all check your Navient right now or your Audible, but if you are getting images of mid thirties black women, I, that would actually be a triumph, but I'm pretty sure that's not what's happening. <laughs> so I think we're going uh, backwards. We're trying to serve people at such a uh, level that's both uh, very specific, but also really general. So this is probably the most general way that you could think of me or describe me um, and my interests. And to me, this is a kind of a regression. So, so that was the dream. The dream, I uh, studied filmmaking um, at NYU. And um, I think the year that I graduated was when Halle Berry and Denzel Washington won Oscars. And I think Spike Lee won an Oscar for documentary. There was like, it felt like a very black Oscars. Um, it still was almost unimaginable to uh, think, you know, we knew it'd be very difficult to enter the film and television industry, but there was still kind of the, the, the edges of like this idea that, you know, someday we'll be here and, you know, our work will be seen. So. This is how, why I'm thinking about 2050. Um, the, uh, the, you, these are all statistics that are mostly known and right, they underscore all of our politics, right? Are people anxious about this demographic change? In 2011, more children from racial minorities were born um, than whites. And um, yeah, we thought that by this point in 2050 or whenever that um, media would be more representative of the media consumers and that more opportunities would be granted from a wider range of, of groups. Um, and again, I had this conversation very, uh, just a couple years ago with someone who was in her early 20s, 
and she was showing me all of the YouTube channels that she watches. She was, um, she was Indian and most of what she watched was content by South Asian content producers. And so I asked her, well, who else is seeing this? Like who else is looking at this? And she was like, well, like sometimes someone will comment and they're like, you know, first generation Nigerian or first generation. But I said, you know, this is exactly it. Like, I don't know how much of this is going to, to get out. I don't even know about it and I wouldn't know how to find it. But so people, again, this idea that we're kind of burrowing deeper and deeper and deeper is concerning to me. Um, so this is what the reality is like, which we all know. This is a screenshot from when I select the search tool in Instagram. Um, so it's showing me very, I mean, most of this, none of this content really applies to anything that has to do with my life. I get lots of hair videos, hair tutorial videos. I do not have hair. Um, lots of information on reality show, uh, reality TV show stars, which I do not watch. Um, and uh, then there's always like inspirational memes. Uh, sometimes like this is like black achievement sort of memes. Here's what people are, are accomplishing. We should be proud of these young woman who started her own company or this kid that got into five Ivy League schools. But this has persistently been the type of content that shows up that's recommended to me when I use Instagram. Um, what's in my feed is uh, quite different. Right now I mostly have uh, accounts by people who are based in the Bronx because I'm doing a big research project in the Bronx right now looking into gentrification and I'm looking at photography um, and that's sort of that's sort of it and I think I've gotten rid of a lot of the aspirational uh, boss lady ads that come my way as well like aspirational boss lady clothings and meal prep kits and all of the things so um, so again, it's a very basic way to think about who I am. So my feeling, of course, is that like we're, this, our diffusion of attention undermines our ability, um, undermines, um, excuse me, let me start over. So A, this diffusion of, of uh, attention does undermine our ability to have a commons. It undermines the kind of ideals that someday there'll be a forum where we all meet and understand each other's cultures, right? And the nuances of each other's cultures as it applies to photographers, which is what I've been thinking about, um, you know, I think I work with a lot of younger photographers as well through Magnum Foundation and other, other um, programs and initiatives. And a lot of them are still saying, oh, I'm publishing my work for everyone. They'll plan some elaborate website with no like SEO marketing or no conversion plan from Instagram to the website. And they still imagine a very broad audience and the broad audience is basically gone. This is unfortunate because um, this means, in my view, public opinion is being shaped by the viral in many cases. So it's been actually disappointing to see uh, work by documentary filmmakers and photographers, for example, that cover uh, issues affecting African-American communities. But most of that conversation about what's African-Americans are perceived in need uh, were shaped through viral videos of police violence. So that to me is a very, there was a very clear example of like two kind of different sets of ideas and the viral one took uh, dominance. So, uh, so yeah, so how can image makers and photographers operate in this, in this ecosystem? What can they do? How can they really just double down on the fact that they're going to be publishing for relatively much smaller audiences, potentially audiences that are already uh, attuned to photography, um, people that are already sympathetic to their work, um, friends, family, other, pho other photography aficionados, um, and maybe work does not get out. I teach uh, undergraduates in a program called Stanford in New York, which is a study away program for Stanford students here. And uh, usually my students have not, well, first of all, most of them report that they've not really You've seen a magazine or have used a magazine or have seen documentary photography at all. Um, you know, we've a different, over the course of teaching this many semesters now, I asked them about certain images like Alan Curdy, the Syrian boy that was on the beach. None of them had seen it. Um, the image by John Moore of the little girl at the um, Mexican border with her mother. Maybe one person had seen it, right? So these are, in another era, might have been more defining images 
images of our time or help us understand certain issues in a particular way. Uh, but they're just in my very unscientific sample of, of my small group of Stanford students from year over year. Uh, it's, it's, they're looking at something completely different or it doesn't happen to show up in their feed. So, um, so I'll give you some, some more statistics to sort of help us think through, think through this. So if you remember Alexander Nix, who was the sort of uh, very confident British man who was the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, which is the, the company that was really at the center of the Facebook scandal. Uh, he said, my children will certainly never ever understand the concept of mass communication. And uh, you can see why. So right now, our country is about 327 million people. We'll see where we end up after the census. But most magazines are circulating around 3 million copies. That's it. Um, we also have television news shows that really, excuse me, the top network shows have about 18.5 million viewers, which is about 15 million viewers than in the 90s. So if you were watching TV in 1995, 96, which was like right before the explosion of, cha of cable channels, a top TV show like uh, Seinfeld might have had 30 million viewers. So now we have about 18 million viewers, but we have about 65 million more people living here, right? So everything's getting much smaller. Um, cable news channels are reaching about 3 million people a night during prime time. And uh, so, and digital and print subscriptions to the New York Times, I think this number has now changed as of the last year. But as of when I wrote this in 2018, there were about 3.5 million worldwide. Think about Life Magazine had about 7.5 million subscribers in, in the mid 60s, right? So the, the media industry is sort of collapsing. There is fewer people looking. Um, digital numbers are also you know, they com might command more, but it's not the same as sustained engagement. So you all know how you use your phones, right? You're sort of looking at what happens to come your way. Maybe you look for two seconds. In terms of photographers, you're not, people are not looking at a fully realized photo essay or a story or a set of ideas. You might flip through a few. Uh, so you're not really, you're at a disadvantage in terms of communicating ideas over uh, like an arc or an, you know, over a number of images. So. Um, so that's a bit of where, where we are, and that's where photographers in particular have to think about. So I'll tell you now an anecdote, um, just to switch platforms a bit. Uh, a friend of mine from college, actually two people I know from college had films in Sundance this year, and it was remarkable, right? So I just mentioned to you that uh, you know, we knew how challenging it would be to ever make a feature. Um, this year, I think maybe two thirds or so of the people in the dramatic category at Sundance were either women or people of color, which is, you know, had, could never have been imagined before. Um, my friend was making a film about a Congolese family's reunification here in Brooklyn and how challenging that was after not seeing each other for 17 years. So this is wonderful, right? Maybe this is the dream, right? New people are being able to produce films. Um, and there are many options for where these films could go, but it's also fairly circumscribed, and that's the downside. So if these films get picked up, they could go into the streaming ecosystem, which is all, all, also driven by algorithms, but there's also so many options. Um, so will, the, will the, the masses, excuse me, really be able to see the efforts of this new multicultural group of filmmakers? This is uh, uh, from a chart that was published in the New York Times. This is from a story called Box Office Hit or Best Picture at the, off at the Oscars. You can rarely have both. It's from 2018. So it's tracking the kinds of films uh, that have won best, the films that have won Best Picture and where they were in the box office. So if we see all the way back, starting in, I don't know quite what year this is, in the early 80s, E.T. won Best Picture. It was also, excuse me, E.T., E.T., Gandhi won Best Picture. E.T. was at the box office, but they really aren't that far away from each other in terms of where they ranked in the box office. Um, this is when movies were about people, when the blockbuster movies were about people and they weren't you know, the Marvel franchise or they weren't fantasy films or what have you. We get to more recent times and we see a film like Moonlight, which won Best Picture. Um, and it was 
somewhere between 90 and 100 in the box office, right? The top film that year, I think, was Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. So again, so we can diversify and maybe offer different kinds of stories, but um, partly for cultural reasons also, people are not seeing them and, and, and the resources are not being devoted. Related to that, <clears throat> These are some, this is some information I hope people can see. Um, it is taken from a study that was done by UCLA on uh, diversity in Hollywood, and it also looks at audience patterns. So this first slide, this shows the top cable shows among Asian households and then black households. Um, it also shows Latino and white households, and in many cases are completely different TV shows, totally. So here we have, there's some shows that overlap, The Walking Dead, American Crime Story. Um, the black households are watching shows that largely don't show up on anybody else's, on anybody else, in anybody else's top 10. Um, and they also control most of the market share in many of these cases. Go to this one for a second. So, so this gives us another picture of how people are kind of moving into completely different directions and are looking at different things. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. So related. So this is a, a Twitter, a Tumblr post that I uh, found out about through reporting. So this is um, a post that is publishing a comment that was made by an actor, a voice actor named Carrie Payton. And he's posted this about the movie Hidden Figures. And uh, he says, my five and eight-year-old daughters watch Hidden Figures again. Then they played, quote, scientists solving equations until bedtime. Thank you, ladies. So this uh, Destiny Rush is a Twitter user who said, this is exactly why representation matters, right? This is a fra the refrain we're hearing all the time, which is sort of starting to lose, I think, any real meaning. And I'll talk a little bit about it. But why representation matters, representation matters, representation matters. So the question of representation becomes complicated, I think, when we can't actually see who's producing the content. This is actually a question for photography as well. And there's a lot of anxieties around this in photojournalism. Who's allowed to tell whose story? We're seeing that anxiety also rise around discussions with um, American Dirt. And this is a question really that we're going to have to figure out, I think, uh, as the country's demographics change? Do people want to restrict themselves to their group or feel allowed to write outside of their experience, um, if experience can be defined at these sort of broad levels of race, gender, class? So Brian Feldman from New York Magazine reported that Destiny Rush, who made this comment, is actually an account used by the Internet Research Agency, which is the um, Russian troll farm, which executed an, an influence campaign in the 2016 election. So as we now know, troll farms uh, infiltrated a lot of left-leaning political conversations. They created um, a very, very popular Black Lives Matter spinoff page. Um, and so Tumblr confirmed, ultimately confirmed 200 accounts that were attributed to the Internet Research Agency. Some of these accounts were called Black and Proud, We Proud to be Black, Blackness by Your Side, Melanin Diary, Bleep the Pol Police, Posting While Black, and Black to the Pones. So they were able to sort of figure out the kind of language and content um, and uh, the, that people were posting. And part of this is because a lot of the content and language we're using to describe our politics, I think, is really platitudinal and pretty easy to, to game if you wanted to. But just to give you a sense of the extent of this uh, influence, so uh, the U.S. House Intelligence Committee found that there were um, over 3,393 advertisements that were purchased by the IRA, the Internet Research Agency. Over 11.4 million Americans had been exposed to these advertisements, so that's almost as many people that are watching the top TV shows in the United States, and more people than are reading uh, some of the magazines or newspapers that I mentioned to you. There were 470 pages that were created by the Internet Research Agency, 80,000 pieces of organic content, and um, exposure to that organic content to more than 126 million Americans. So when we say representation matters and it's getting such a reach and it's not actually even being produced um, by 
a member of a particular group, what does that mean and how do we even begin to suss out who is a part of our group and whether we can trust it. Um, on the note of representation, I'll, I'll say another thing that I'm sort of thinking through. I remember uh, when I was young, and maybe for some of you in the room, you can remember when there were almost no black people on television. It seems uh, crazy now. There were not as many black people in athletics, but there were maybe just a couple of shows during prime time. This is, I'm talking about now the very early 80s before the Cosby show. Uh, my mother said that I would run, my sister and I would run to the television whenever a black person appeared, which is very interesting because my entire world at that point was black. So uh, this is where we see the idea of, of the kind of TV view of the world as the media scholars talk about it. Um, and, you know, understanding that something is missing and almost wanting the, the validation because this doesn't look like the reality that I'm used to. I remember my mother telling me uh, this story about when she and her co cousins cried when Vanessa Williams won Miss America and became the first black Miss America. At that point, identity was thought in much more broader terms. She's black, she's female. Um, these other considerations, which I think are, are useful, um, like complexion, class, body type, sexuality, regional identity, that had not really been articulated, right? Back then, it was just, this is a black person that's on television. Uh, so I'm thinking a lot about how that's different from the words I found uh, from a writer, a black woman writer. Um, I read an interview where she was describing uh, how the process of meeting her editor and how she knew it was great and how she did not feel represented. Her story was represented because she um, grew up upper middle class and felt that that experience was not covered in the media. And when she talked about her editor, she's like, oh, she was a black woman who had also gone to private school in Southern California. It just was so specific. <laughs> it was so specific. And that's how she knew like this was going to be, that was her person, right? So people are getting more and more uh, particular and specific in certain ways. So like I said, again, there's sort of these general ideas and the general ideas are maybe what's coming at us, but I think people are also articulating their identity in really specific ways and in ways that can make it actually harder to build coalition or to see yourself in others. So here is where I think the algorithm satisfies and it satisfies towards solipsism. So you will eventually see yourself, but who will ever see you? So um, with these considerations in mind, um, I'm thinking a lot about how to train people for this. I think a lot about, and that, that's on many, many levels. So um, these are some of the things I think about in terms of training young photographers and writers and, 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 and those who are kind of going to make up the future of this country. Who's going to be in charge? Uh, who, will, who will be properly educated and who will have the resources? So I think about institutions and um, you know, if there will be a transition to um, you know, leadership and ownership of some um, media organizations, for example, that uh, are more representative of the demographic or are we gonna live in a place that looks like South Africa where the people who've historically benefited are just gonna continue to have the resources and rule? Um, but then how do you make that transition? You can't do like Zimbabwe and kick everybody out. <laughs> so these are some challenging things. And I, I ask young photographers in particular, I want them to think about, not to think of themselves as tokenizing an industry or finding their little piece, but to understand that ultimately, ideally, they will be taking this over. Not because of, just because of sort of natural, natural changes, right, in our population. I don't know if that's actually going to happen. Who will be properly educated? Uh, I've been, as I mentioned, I've been doing um, work and research on the Bronx and I'm working on a piece right now about the art and uh, gentrification, the understanding of art and gentrification that's happening right now in the Bronx. And there's been a lot of anxiety um, around what is seen as like fancy art or fancy people coming from downtown. And there was a recent um, public forum with a number of, of pretty young artists, artists from of different ages. And there was a survey that was done and a number of them said, um, because one of them in particular said, because of my Bronx education, I'm not able to like write a grant application. I can't fill this out or we're not properly trained to actually have these jobs in these museums. I don't understand um, some of the language that is used. This is too challenging for me. 
So this is a question that really frightens me and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot in photography, especially as photography is trying to, um, the photography industry, particularly a documentary, um, is trying to become more inclusive and a lot of times efforts of becoming inclusive still assume a certain class position. So what does it mean to truly be inclusive and prepare people who may not have had, who may not have who may not be able to you know, write very well or don't feel confident in their writing, who, um, who may be coming with a different set of needs and considerations, who are taking care of their family members. I've been involved with a number of programs where almost always someone's trauma really comes to the forefront. And these are non-US populations, but also the idea of bringing in people who are working um, in their home countries in a place where maybe there has been you know, disaster or uh, cultural attitudes against therapy or uh, you know, other issues. So there's always been, the last few programs I've been involved with, someone who's kind of been a bit like immobilized and we've had to find a way to like, get them to do the work. So these are some things to consider. It's not the same as education, but. So also who will have the resources, um, especially as this industry uh, is less and less financially rewarding. Uh, I wrote something in 2015 or 2016 for a report the NEA did uh, and on the topic of the potential for labor organizing in photography. Um, I, I doubt it will happen, but uh, you know, pay is in many cases sort of stayed the same for the last 30 years and pay is often late. It's an industry that is really now increasingly reliant on freelancers. There's very few staff jobs. Newspapers are uncutting their entire staffs and sending out reporters with iPhones, this sort of thing. So, um, so I think it's been this way for at least as long as I've been working in, in the industry, but that people who do come from um, uh, maybe upper middle class homes or who have um, family resources are the ones who can afford to get into something that really doesn't pay that much money. So um, what can we do to work around that if we wanna have a more diverse field? Hmm. Okay, so also these questions, um, who can tell whose story? Who will watch? And what, what can we learn? And I don't say what can we learn as something optimistic, but what, more like what will we be able to learn um, if we're not able to see one another's perspective or we're not able to see the work that's being produced? How will that lend to our understanding of the country we're actually living in and the experience of the people in those places? Um, yeah, so these are some of the things that I think about. Um, I had an experience recently watching the last debate. So the last two debates are the ones where there's no more candidates of color on the stage and I, there's an extended portion where, which I'm calling the black portion of the debate, where they're jockeying to seem the most woke and they're saying what they think they're going to do. And uh, that experience also echoed conversations that I was having with certain friends. And I just realized like everyone's just kind of gonna stand on stage and speak for me, <laughs> speak for my experience. Whether it's the politicians, whether it's people within a certain social class who are you know, pontificating on what everyone else needs out there in the rest of America, right? So this is at the heart of actually our ideas about representation. This is, political representation is really not that different from I think some of the things we're gonna have to ask. How much faith are we willing to put in others to speak for us and to understand what we've what we've gone through or what our needs are or what our desires are. Um, is political representation an example of um, what we might have to arrive upon in these other, in these other areas, the arts and media that we care about? Um, sorry, I lost my thought there. I had a realization as I was talking to you and then I lost it <laughs> and then I lost it. Um, so, so yeah, so, there's so much distrust around, this goes back to my question of who can tell whose story. Sorry, that's where that went. Um, what I'm hoping will happen is that eventually people will feel, I'm hoping there'll be a, a, a kind of reinstatement of the kind of ideals that I feel I came of age with, 
where it was expected that people could ha experience cultural fluidity and be culturally competent across experience and, and to share and to trust and to trust someone else to take up that, their story. Um, and to be interested and curious, genuinely curious about someone else's story. That's my hope. I'm not sure that we'll get there. I'm getting old enough now to understand that things do move in cycles. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this. So I just want to end before we can do questions and just conversation, because again, these are just some, some notes and thoughts I'm having. But um, this is a question uh, from Arturo Escobar, who's thinking about the pluriverse. So he says, can design be reoriented from, from its dependence on the marketplace towards creative experimentation with forms, concepts, territories, and materials, especially when appropriated by subaltern communities struggling to redefine their life projects in a mutually enhancing manner with the earth. So much of my work and thinking is actually doubling down on smaller audiences and thinking more local, which are not necessarily the same thing. Uh, I gave an example in, the, in the, the essay, much of this talk is, is informed by of a young uh, African-American photographer I was working with who was doing a project on black home ownership in the section of Queens. It has historically always had a very high percentage of black home ownership. It's really like one of these beautiful suburban looking Queens neighborhoods. It's like picturesque and quiet. And while I was working with him as a mentor on this project, I had a conversation with my barber who said that he, he was saying, oh, he happened to bring this up. Like we never see images of us as homeowners and we only ever saw that on like TV and like just a couple of shows. So. This is a person who's living like 10 blocks away from this photographer who's making this work, right? But they're not in the same algorithms. They're not even in the same media, media ecosystems at all. So what would, it mean to, what would it mean to try to figure that out, right? And to say, to, for photographers to take on some of these practices for themselves, even though I think a lot of these practices are heinous, but to, but to invest in or look into uh, targeting targeting their audiences in very specific ways um, and to take on some of the kind of practices that we're seeing in advertising as a way to reach people and maybe to get out of thinking about proving something on the main stage to the mainstream to disprove stereotypes or what have you, but who else could benefit from this work um, and how else can you show it? A lot of my uh, thinking about this has in, in practice has been done through exhibitions at the Bronx Documentary Center. Um, which is, uh, you know, very much rooted in, in its neighborhood of uh, Melrose, uh, which is maybe two or three subway stops from Manhattan, depending on the train that you take. And there are people who've not been to Manhattan. So uh, the work that we did there was hyper-local. And what does it really mean to produce exhibitions in this low information zone where not everybody's on the internet? And it's very, very hard to find a uh, New York Times or, or really any newspaper. So how do you bring work in from other places? When we did one of our first events, someone said, you're bringing, they're connect, you're bringing the, world to the, Bronx, the Bronx to the world and the world to the Bronx. So there are these neighborhoods where people feel incredibly isolated from a city like New York where there's so much opportunity if you know how to tap into it, if you have 275 for the Metro card, um, if you have been educated in the circles that will open these things up to you. But um, this question about reor reorienting from the dependence on the market towards other kinds of exportation with forms concepts is something that I think could be a way, could be a way forward. So uh, I will end it there. We can maybe take some questions and just talk if you like. Thank you. I'll end it here. <laughs> so I would say there's two, there, there are a few answers here. Um, one is that um, like hyper segmentation and the marketing has been a tactic now that's been used in one way or another for maybe the last 25, 30 years in a way, but it's gotten very, very, very specific. So what you saw with Cambridge Analytica, for example, is they would produce different types of ads that were all about the Second Amendment, but they were able to use uh, psychometric data. So they used this information that could figure out what your personality was like and your values and tailor an ad to you. So if you care about guns because you, uh, they find that you're a tradition oriented person and you care about family, they may uh, do an ad that shows you hunting with your son. But if you care about guns because you 
are fearful, they find your personality to be neurotic and fearful, then they'll do an ad where you're, you're protecting yourself from an intruder. So it's getting that, and these are still all Trump, like Trump people who are for guns, right? So it's getting that specific. So these are the tools that have been used now. So there are people who aren't even seeing the same ads for the same thing. I mean, we aren't even seeing the same prices for the same thing, actually, when we go online, right? So, uh, so this is part of it. And these tools are used more and more because they want to be successful and reach who they can reach. So the idea now, and I think what troubles me is that um, betterment, if Betterment wants my business, they feel that I will identify most with seeing like what they think is closest to what I think of myself and that I will not respond to seeing an image from any other ethnic group, which for me is not true, but they're, that's the assumption that we're banking on. We're banking on that people can see less and less of themselves in others. And that's what really frightens me about how we're gonna all live together. I mean, I think it's too late. I think it's, because it's not also just like the people deciding who they want to target, but it's our own behaviors. And in fact, studies are showing that it, it's less about, um, like your bubble is, is really more informed by who you know and, who's in, and who do you know. So um, many people know people who are more or less like them, and that reinforces the information more than um, anything sort of splitting you off. So it's tricky, but it's also, I mean, it's almost, I... It's almost like a biological kind of... Well, I mean, that gets, right, like how do we form tribes? I don't, you know, that can be, we could talk about that forever. But I think that, but you know, but also people like you can mean something very broadly. It can mean like other people who are in interested in arts writing. It can mean other people from the town where you were raised. It can, you know, so we all have like a multiplicity of selves, right? And now, now I think people are finding out how to um, use that to their ends in particular kinds of advertising. But um, yeah, so part of it is also like, what are you looking, like what are your practices when you're online? And what are you seeking out? Or are you just receiving whatever comes to you? Most of my students look at news through social media, which is just whatever happens to come to them. And it's really also a lot of opinion writing and not deep reporting. So it's just like, it's just a wash of just stuff that you pick out, which is different than like, I'm going to look at three different newspapers, you know, and, and look at these things, right? So there, we do have some control over it. We have control in terms of what we search. I'm, I'm not gonna get into like fake news and all of that, but, um, but yeah, like, we have some control. We have control within a bubble, right? So I can make probably a thousand different choices and still be in an East Coast um, uh, master's degree having <laughs> bubble, you know? I'm out with my friend. We don't see any of us, none of us are seeing the same thing. And like at certain demographic levels, we're pretty much the same. Some years ago, my cousin in Maryland became a part of this online community of aspiring life coaches. And it's all of these people who produce, who, there's all of these like accountability groups and different sorts of Facebook groups. And she was adding me to all these groups. And um, what I'm interested in, actually I have an answer. So, okay, this, this actually takes me off into another thing that I'm very interested in right now. So I think there's a conversation that's happening uh, there are people who are kind of controlling and setting the agenda for what we should uh, care about and how the, what the issues within any particular group are. But what I found when I joined my cousin's group is, uh, groups, or when I surveyed them, was that they were black, but they were like completely different from the black New York art people I know or any other circle I was a part of. Um, and frankly, there's probably more of, of everybody else, right? There's like suburban, um, um, I think like a mix of education levels, what have you. But, um, you know, there's this term that I learned about this summer, which is probably one of the, the ideas I'm most excited about and is like so deeply affirming because I knew this day would come. But it's a pejorative term called Blavity Black. Have you heard this? Has anyone heard this? So Blavity is this black uh, like tech site for, it's a site for like black millennials. Um, I'm too old for it, but I had heard of it. So the term Blavity Black is a pejorative term that refers to the type of black person 
that Blavity is targeted by, and, it, and it's black people who have come up with it. So they're saying all of these people who are producing content on HBO and, and all these shows, they're all um, black people who grew up in suburbs or in entirely white environments who get make their living off of promoting an idea of black culture. And they, they um, surface issues that nobody else actually cares about. And they are hyper aggressive in their performance of their race. Whether you agree with that or not, and, and I, I, I don't know that I agree with all, I find it very exciting and very interesting that there is this internal intra-black critique <laughs> where people are saying sort of, it's analogous to what you hear from people who uh, are on the right who feel like they need Roseanne because their lives are not shown. They're like, this is, you all are not representing us and there's more of us. So I think part of it is also like when I go to like who has resources, it's also who has access and to what, to what, what networks. Um, in terms of what we end up seeing and who we end up seeing, which is why it's really important to me to make sure that people are able to have an opportunity that come from different backgrounds and don't come from those um, networks. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's a very, very provocative one is like, where do you get the image? So when I go to this, I'm like, oh, is this what's out there? I don't, is it, I don't know. I'm like, how many, is everybody seeing, all the black people seeing the same thing or is it differentiated somehow or no, right? So I'm also looking at it as um, in a way like an outsider, um, partly because I just don't participate in some of these forms of mass culture, right? So yeah, is this, I don't know. This is an image, this is something that's out there, right? That's being produced. And then of course the other part of it is part of what's out there, what has been out there for the last few years was produced by Russian trolls. So I don't know how much we can trust any of it. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying definitively that we can or we can't. It's something I wanna think about more. But yeah, what is the image or the depiction of the group? Um, and also I'm pretty sure many of these accounts, cause I've looked into it, are just like produced by, I don't think they're produced by I don't know who's producing them, but there are reposts of things. I'm pretty sure some of them are also produced like in Macedonia or um, was it Macedonia was the other troll farm. So I don't know. There's ways sometimes that it uses lang the posts use language that I'm like, I don't know that's completely right. So, so yeah, I think what's more worrying, what, what's become very interesting to me is uh, I feel that media has replaced folk culture so I feel, I was born in 1980, I've come at like the very end of um, being able to learn from people who experienced folk culture and understood blackness and cultural identity without ever being represented in the media. I find now more and more I have students who are like, I don't see my very specific self in the media. Like I had a student say, or write to me in this paper, like there's only four black queer women characters in mainstream video games and what does that say about me and my value? And I was like, girl, you better talk to your grandmother and ask her like, <laughs> how she had a sense of self. But I, I do see this like increased dependence. I do see this increased dependence and, and over-reliance in a way on media because maybe that's kind of what this is. And I'm also seeing people kind of internalizing uh, you know, television shows and other examples as being their culture, right? Which is like, it's a part of it, but so it's, it's I don't know, much more of it, and I'm not even necessarily the most, the, the person like to, to speak to it because I occupy a very rarefied position, right? I'm very aware of that. But um, yeah, so it's, it's worrying when you, you see the cycle of people kind of like acritically ingesting, uh, you know, media, television, radio that's been produced for profit and believing that to be their identity and like recirculating it. And so I think that problem is kind of existing on many levels, which you referred to, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of a bit more about like institutions with resources like the New York Times versus, um, and if, you know, that very well might cannibalize, these sorts of institutions just might be the only ones left and alternative culture I think alternative culture will always flourish in different ways and you know digitally but um yeah i'm not sure you know i wrote something this summer a review of the whitney biennial that was thinking about this demographic change and how it might be reflected in the ways the artists um kind of presented themselves and the way the work was presented 
And um, yeah, I was thinking through like, what's the difference between a mainstream and just a, a majority, right? A demographic majority. So yeah, I mean, there are probably touchstones that we can consider mainstream. The Super Bowl might be one. Um, but the Super Bowl almost always has the highest ratings above any TV show. So the Super Bowl will still get about like 25 million viewers or something like that. But um, I, I think what's more interesting is believing, I think what more people more have a tendency to do is believe themselves to be a part of a mainstream and sort of extrapolate outwards. Like I know about it and everybody else knows about it and really to not understand how limited it is. And when, I mean, I think this really came into focus when people first began to understand the way the alt-right was using media. Um, and when I did a dive into that, I mean, it's like, it is an, it's, it's another world. It's just a complete, it's another world, right? So, but they have been able to, part of it is you need an amplifier. So you still are gonna need these amplifiers that have more reach or more audience or, excuse me, more resources in a way to target or to get more eyeballs looking at it. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I don't know if I've answered your question, but it's, I, I don't, I think you're right in that it's just, it's, it's, and it's really, it's very hard to absorb in a way, but it, it really is so divided, but I am not willing to write it off completely because I, I just, again, I occupy a, a very particular position and I have very different media habits, you know, media consumption in terms of the films I watch and everything else. And I might be completely missing things. I'm sure that I am, and I don't want to privilege my, I don't want to do what I'm saying and privilege that everyone does what I do. And every, like, maybe everyone's all hanging out somewhere I don't know about, but yeah. <laughs> it's possible. Um, but I'm not so sure. It's really, it can, it can be hard to like really get your head around the level of how many bubbles you're in. Cause I'm in a specific bubble here in, you know, with people in this room, I probably have a number of things in common and then that might go out to people I went to college with who are not in the arts and then, you know, then I'll go see my family in New Jersey and there's things that they are not a part of but we still have some overlap and then there's something even beyond that and that, a lot of that is unknown. Like, we, that's the thing. That's why it's a bubble in a way. I think bubble's a bad word because at least a bubble is see-through. This is something else. Like, we don't even know there are other forms of communities and ideas that are being circulated and we don't even know, it doesn't even touch, it doesn't overlap at all. Um, Charles Murray, the infamous author of The Bell Curve and other, other things, who has a book out now. Um, he had a book that was actually well received uh, some years ago. I can't quite remember the name of it, but it was looking at the difference between um, white Americans and their, and class. And there was this quiz that was published on PBS to see how big your bubble was. And you know, one of the questions I remember the most was, you know, what does the word Branson mean to you? And uh, Branson is apparently the biggest vacation location in the United States. I had never heard, nobody I knew has ever heard of it, ever, right? So, so, so yeah, so it's, it's surprising when we're able to discover these things. And then it's scary, <laughs> I think, and so. Other questions? So to what extent does the language used by those who are not a part of, who are, yeah, the disparate parts, as you said, all of these microcultures, to what extent is that a factor in their, in their not being able to get other people? Um, I, don't, I don't know that that's it. I mean, I think it's really, I think it's more so because that, I think, becomes an issue if you find that other disparate part. That only becomes an issue if you're able to access it and locate it. But if you can't access it and locate it, then it's kind of moot, right? I think. And then that's then there's like another level of problem. Like I was looking at this, um, I was looking at this review last night on this site, and I could just tell. I had aged out of it. I could just tell like the, the way they used language and the way that they, they, that they wrote. And it was all sort of black millennials and maybe some college students that were writing like very thoughtful pieces about television and culture and the sort of thing. But uh, I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to decide to learn this language or appreciate this use of language um, if I wanna participate, like, I don't know, participate in understanding how they're circulating ideas. 
Um, but I met, well, I guess my, that's more of an age related thing. I guess that's always been the case. But um, I mean, what's, what I have seen in, in some that was surprising is when I looked into the alt-right is that a lot of the rules of internet humor was the same as that I've seen in any other space. So there's a certain way that like jokes progress over threads and that like someone will alter a letter in one thing and then it becomes even funnier. Like I was, I actually actually pick it up pretty easily, like to understand what was happening and the logic behind the way that they communicated because it followed a certain, uh, I don't know, not a template, but it just sort of followed the, the rules of what have now become um, internet forum bo- forums and like chat boards. So, so I, there might be something like underlying that allows you to access or to understand that makes it a bit less be- bewildering if you can get to it. Um, but I guess to me, it's still about can you can you get to it? So, there's a plugin called Flipfeed on Twitter where it will show you a random person's feed. Uh, that is what they believe is on the opposite ideological spectrum from yours. So it's already surveyed what they think you're about and then they show you an opposite. And it's fast, I mean, it's just like, there's just endless stuff out there. It's just endless, there's endless, it's, it's, I think it's very hard because we are only looking at, even though we feel like we're looking at way too much information, it's still just a fraction. It's only ever gonna be a fraction. And someone else is looking at a different fraction and it might overlap a little bit with what you're looking at, but the, the term algorithm is also very broad and, and we can use it to apply to things where that's not even actually necessarily correct. I mean, machine learning is an important way to think about this too. Like at some point, it's not, you know, it sort of is running on its own and making changes as it goes. Um, but I'm not, I don't know this. I actually don't know the specifics. I do know there's certain... Uh, software or methodologies that are being absorbed by many different places. So the the research that went into the Cambridge Analytica work was started by someone at Stanford University who had written a paper about the way uh, that social sciences might actually benefit from looking at people's like psycho psychometric data. So that's where that started. <laughs> and now it's been uh, abs- absorbed into all of these other uses. So apply magic sauce is a site you can go to and it scans your social media and tells you based on the big five personality traits what it thinks you are. Um, And I published my profile in this story and uh, people like, you're so brave. I was like, it doesn't mean that it's true. (laughs) Like, just because it's what I put on social media doesn't, it doesn't mean anything necessarily, right? So, So there's some software like that that's sort of being sucked and you know, applied in many different places. Um, but I don't quite have a handle on, you know, what are, if there are like five key proprietary approaches. Um, but it's, you know, it is in everything. So, I mean, don't, don't use, uh, get a points card at any pharmacy or store. They're just like, everything's being collected from everywhere, <laughs> you know? And it's all just being sucked into the, you know, yeah, I mean, I I think that there are ways, I think part of this can be achieved through partnering with people who do this very well. So people who really understand SEO or, or, or you know, people who really understand how to get stuff out, like marketing people and, and digital, um, digital planners and these sorts of media planners and those sorts of people. Um, I am a little afraid it's too... I mean, you know, for a while you saw people who were posting ads. So I saw when Facebook was big, I saw photographers posting ads. And in that process, you can begin to target who you want to see your work. So that's why I say either people have to take on some of these practices and the tools will have to be developed for them to do that. Because right now they don't really exist, I don't think, for an individual consumer of these products. Either you will have to do that yourself or partner with people who, who can do that. Um, I mean, I think it, it's good for everyone should look at the way the um, ad preferences that Facebook and Google assign to you. If you know where to do that, find that in your accounts and to see what categories they have you filed under, but to also understand what the other categories could be, because some of them get very specific. And again, when we get into psychological information, 
like, are you neurotic versus are you open to experience? Like, you, everyday people do not, and I don't think should have the access to that kind of data, right? There's no going back. There's no, like, there's no, there's, there's no, I mean, what, how many, what would be required for us to go back? There would have to be, let's start with just how many cable channels there are. That was the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to eliminate all of those and people would have to watch their news on three channels again like they did for, you know, a lot of the 20th century. Um, I mean, the thing is, is going back does come with losses. Like he was saying, like, it is a great thing that a blogger can write and express themselves and that people can organize on Twitter and all of these, all of that. But we'd have to lose all of that as well. So... I don't know. I mean, something that I, I want to pay a bit more attention to is what Facebook's going to do. So at some point they announced that they would be collapsing WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook, and there'd be no more broad publishing. You'd just be publishing into small groups of friends, sort of this thing. I mean, that will be transformative, right? Then we're really like, then there's really no shared anything, right? Except maybe things go, go viral, but I imagine that's things are still going viral within certain groups, right? Some of these groups can be quite big, but it's still, it's not necessarily the same as, as a, like a common. So, but I think, I don't want to, I didn't, I, there are a lot of things that I worry about. The question about resources is one, the question um, how groups are going to live with each other um, and will they be able to form coalition? Because that was really, I didn't articulate it that way, but that was sort of the assumption with multiculturalism that there would be coalition and people would be people would be together. And, you know, I hope people can find that. Um, I hope may, they won't need media to see media from other groups in order to do that. Um, but I don't know. I think about, I think about the Balkans. I think about Bosnia. Like, I think about these places where there have been a multicultural um, population that has not been able to really come together. So I don't know if we're going to be in that situation or not. I actually, tr Trump being in office actually has changed things, I think, since I first really started thinking about this. Um, I do think there's more of a, an impetus for a common, like working together towards something for people who are, who are like focusing on getting Trump out of office. But, um, but I do wonder, like, how are power struggles going to play out over who gets seen where? And I don't know. Right. Well, they're not influencing the algorithm. They're creating the content themselves that is copying what they think people are responding to. And, and they are responding in many ways. So, but I think I, I want to get away. And also because I, um, I cannot speak super authoritatively on the way that these things are designed in all these cases. But I just want to get away from the idea that like there's a guy or there's a firm who's writing down the algorithm. A lot of times it's learning that there's lots of women who read novels and so that's the pattern. And so if you like f fit what they think is the pattern, you'll get swooped up into, into it. So it, it may be on certain cases where somewhere I entered somehow for like the internet knows my race because I don't know if I put that on Facebook in 2006 when I signed up, I don't know and that's just followed me, it's gonna follow me for the rest of my life. So there are ways to kind of like opt out of that. I have ad blockers on everything, um, so I'm not feeding new information, which might become interesting later too. Like, am I just going to see things from 10 years ago or something? I don't know. But um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, that's why there's, there is failure in all in these things, right? Because they're not accurate. They don't necessarily reflect who we are. But also I think what troubles me more is this idea that um, is the solipsism and that I want to see more of what is completely super, is tailored to me, you know? Even if it was the most accurate understanding of who I am, the assumption that I cannot be curious beyond that is what troubles me. And that's what frightens me. And that's what frightens me about forming coalition and about people coming together or not. So that's, that's my concern. That's the hope, right? That is the hope. But that is, that's part of my concern, which is, um, well, it's, I guess there's a, there's a number of ways to think about this, which is that it's already so divided. So for people to even push back against what they perceive to be the media, they're talking about different things. For some people, they're talking about 
the Fox News ecosystem. For some people, they're talking about something else. So this idea of even what the media is, um, is and how it's uh, experienced is very divided, right? So, um, so people do perceive themselves to be doing that now. People, this is, this is the flourishing of the alt-right. This is the flourishing of, um, uh, what is his name now? I can't remember. What is his name? The guy, the Sandy Hook conspiracy theorist, Alex Jones, right? So there are people who f believe themselves to be pushing back against what they think the, the powerful media industries are. Um, that's happening. That's already happening. And some people might say that they're winning or not. I don't know. But um, yeah, so I, I think you said something else that I wanted to remark upon, which was that it was about the horizontal, who controls it. Well, I mean, one thing is why I actually think this internal analysis uh, critique I talked about is, is like who participates, who's speaking, what opportunities have they had. Um, my friend used this phrase the other day. Uh, what did he say? Neoliberal integration figure. <laughs> like he was, he was, yeah, <laughs> I don't remember what we were looking at, and maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't say. But the point is, like, it is important to have a critique, right, of of what we're looking at, and you know, just because it's been made diverse might not change certain aspects of what that platform is, right, and and what its uh, agenda might be or its preferences or what have you. So I hope I answered your question. Sorry, I think I tap danced around it. This was more like thinking about Sundance was so diverse and you know, the, the it's crazy to think that there were maybe like 20 of us uh, black students and maybe like 40 non-white students in general that were in the film program when I was there. And like five of them are gonna have features this year. It's crazy. I mean, that's just like, I'm still trying to figure figure that out, think that through, but um, you know, it's not gonna be consumed by a broad audience, which was the, the dream and the ideal, I think, that came out of the way people thought about media. And the way, as I mentioned in this story with the young South Asian woman, like that's the assumption, but it's, it's not likely to happen. It'll be seen by large groups of, like large amounts of people that are ultimately small sub-segments of culture, but so do we choose consuming habits to say, like, I'm going to seek out films by Filipino filmmaker? You know, like that's what it's going to have to take that, you know, which I think, which is exciting to think if people come around to wanting to consciously have that kind of cross-cultural uh, knowledge base. When I worked at Magnum years ago, I think Tyler Perry appeared on 60 Minutes or one of these shows. And my boss said to me, like, I've never heard, I'd never heard of this person before. And I was like, I mean, yeah, I mean, to some extent there has been, like BET has served as a kind of separate space for, for black media. But this also goes back to what I was saying, like intraculturally who's consuming it because no one I know watches those programs. They're always quick to say that we need more representation and more black films, but there's like actually tons of stuff that people are looking at, you know, that maybe within a certain educational Play, position or region that other black people aren't watching. So, um, so yeah, so that's always, I think, existed, but I think that um, the assumption to your point is like someday the mainstream will be Tyler Perry plus people from these other groups, you know? I'm not talking about coding, jamming, and if you want someone to do that, I think in your uh, uh, photographer, filmmaker, someone who's trying to get your work, you need to work with somebody else because to your point, there's so many skills now that people have to make, like do while they're hustling that was not required before. So I think that photography has to grow more collaborative. You have to bring more people in instead of trying to master everything. And, and I think, I hope that that could be a model for how people are going to have to move forward really. But I, I agree that it would be great to get people. So this is also, when I showed this, this is the area, like if I go to search, my regular feed, of course, well, first years ago, I removed everyone from my Facebook feed. So the feed is blank when I go to the site. I'm still addicted to typing in facebook.com, but at least when I go, it's empty, right? So that was like my first, well, my previous intervention was to put everybody into categories, people from my hometown, photo people, art activist people, journalists, like just to put them into categories. So just as a way of assessing 
what was what, um, and then I could publish specifically to each of those groups. But as I got through my feed, I clicked for a very long time and manually assorted every manually sorted everyone. Um, I decided, like, yeah, people have to remember these tools are at our disposal, and to use the way that we would like to use them, and um, it's not just sort of this addictive experience that we're involved with. However, I guess I would ask, like, how do you? Only some people got that ever got that training about how to look at media images, right? In the first place. So how how do you get a massive idea like that? Out. What is the best way to do that? I'm sure somebody knows. Like, how do you explain to people how to use this differently? And there are probably universes of people who are already doing that. And there's probably some like very, very smart Gen Z people who are like already on it and way ahead of us. And it hasn't spread to everybody else yet, right? Or maybe it, it probably never will. But so, yeah, I think people have to learn how to understand this and make these things fit our needs rather than the other way around. Um, I've stopped, I've mute anyone on Instagram that goes into their mental health issue. Like there's certain things I've had to realize, like I don't need this in the middle of my Tuesday, but I can use this as a database or a repository and look up this person when I'm interested in them, you know, or look up this category of people. If that's really the easiest way for me to interact with these things, um, rather than just have random stuff coming my way, um, to be more intentional about it. After the election, my first panic was like, do I need to just like give up everything and do media literacy um, for activists? Because I was seeing a lot of practices spread, people posting articles, like not following a story all the way through, for example. Like I can't, I, I am the only person I know that looked at Sandra Bland's autopsy report. It was published on the front page of the New York Times, but it didn't show up in Facebook, so nobody I know looked at it or has an opinion on it. So, you know, so that was the beginning of a process, and I think maybe that kind of education can happen in like in targeted communities. But I guess I come back to the question of like, how do you implement something broad based anymore? A broad how how do you affect broad cultural change? That's a question I'm actually thinking about every day, all the time. And it's a question that's being asked of us now in, the pol in our politics. Isn't that the role of the government? Broad-based cultural change? Can you say why? I, mean, I literally had a text debate like over the course of eight hours about this yesterday. So <laughs> I like in, in the role of government, like so. education? Sure, but media, cons like media yeah. consumption practices? Yes. Literacy, right? Sure, maybe. It could be, but it's also, some people would say that would be opposed, a lot of people are opposed to that being top down, to cultural change coming from the top, but it has to come from the bottom. But our behaviors are changing with each new app. We, we learn new behaviors and we move to the next thing in many cases, um, sometimes without thinking through why we're even, it's like, why am I here? What am I doing? <laughs> why am I, how did I end up here? Um, but the same, like, I think that's an interesting question. Like, whose responsibility is it? Who, who, who will, who can't, who is able to affect that kind of change and, gather, and garner that attention? Um, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying I, I open that up to everyone to think about. Like, we can think about or study Me Too, for example. You could study the alt-right. You could study... Um, I have a student who's looking at like attitudes towards climate over years, like youth involvement in climate over the years, and like those ideas have changed over time. I don't know if they're changing behaviors. It seems like sometimes the market has to get involved. That's what's unfortunate. A new a market has to be created, or like even now there are these apps that you can sign up to um, un unenroll you from all of your junk mail, or from like you you put in this plug in and you figure out what you no longer want to receive in terms of newsletters, but that's just collecting your data that's and selling it. <laughs> so. Right, it creates more pathways. When right. You to undo it. So. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's, you're wrong. I'm just saying it's a great place to start a, we can talk about that more, but. Something that's very, very important to me uh, is social bridging and um, bridging in a way that is kind of disrupting 
traditional social networks so that people have <coughs> people can be in the room and ex have opportunities and have access to people they might not have access to uh, otherwise. And so the BDC is a gallery, so um, it's an exhibition space. So it's showing its prints on the wall. Um, I think for the first show we did an interactive piece that you look through, and I don't know that it's happened again since. And then there's guided tours and guided tours to schools, senior, set, senior centers in the area, college groups, whomever, like really thinking about who is here, who would be interested. Um, so I left the BDC four years ago, and it's five years ago, I don't remember now. Um, and you know, since I've left, there's a year-long program in uh, three senior centers in three housing projects. So for like nine months, 10 months, people that are 65 and up take photography classes and go on field trips and do this sort of thing. So part of it, this is what I talk about with like getting outside the market and thinking hyper locally and what's here. So, if, you know, in order for the BDC to be a newcomer to the neighborhood and do community uh, work that served in its immediate community and also the larger photography community, we did a lot of research on uh, like every panel discussion was followed by a conversation with people in the community who was working on similar issues. So we showed a film about, um, you know, youth mar child marriage in Yemen and then had a panel discussion with like four people who were working on, you know, women, the rights of women and girls in the Bronx. So we accumulated a lot of information about like who's working on green space, who's working on uh, paternal rights, who's work like all of these kinds of issues. And I think through that you also begin to build and that's Maybe that's the way, like it's just, again, hyper-targeting in a different way. Um, and then you get all those people in the room and they cross-pollinate and build with each other. Um, so, so that's how um, a lot of the work was done during this foundation, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've made six posts to Instagram since 2016, or maybe nine by this point, that's it. And then I might post to Twitter a handful of, I mean, really, very infrequently and I'm not posting on Facebook anymore pretty much at all. I think my last post was I was asking people see sometimes this is why it's useful because you can survey people from a lot of different demographics. I was asking people about images they saw around 9-11 and um, I think that might have been one of my last posts. So I, I don't I can just be I know for me what was more important I know it's supposed to be important in terms of building network community and staying on top of everything. I know for me uh, a very impo important part of my transition from arts administration into being able to do writing was I had to get off because I just heard noise and I wanted my 90s brain back very badly. That's what I kept telling people. And I just, and especially because it was during the time where a lot of people were, were um, expressing their trauma about, expressing their grief over all of the images circulating of police brutality. Uh, it was like every time I went on something, I was receiving that. And I had to realize, like, I just actually came to this site for five minutes as a distract. Like, why am I now deep into the, like, again, be paying attention to why I'm using this and how, and like, how did I get here 20 minutes later and why? And why, and is this serving my needs? So, um, so I, I believe in it. I know other people who are not on that much. And, and maybe it's because they're at a place where like opportunities have opened for them at a level where they don't have to be online. Um, I'm not gonna be, you know, I'm not gonna take a hard line yes or no, because obviously it's great to be able to reach people through social media, but I think it comes back to monitoring your own behaviors and your motivations. Um, and, but I don't, I don't know. It could be, maybe I'm missing out on like a whole bunch of wonderful um, professional opportunities and uh, not reaching as many people as I can. It's very possible. Partly also when I write, I have a, an email. So l l the last couple of things that I've been able to work on, I've circulate through like an enormous email list. And I know a lot of those people are active and then they circulate it. So knowing like if you have amplifiers kind of in your mix, that can be helpful too. But that's my, that's it. I'm using myself as an example, but I think that, I don't know, I feel like we're only here for so long on this planet and like, how do I want to use my time and to, and who, what do I owe people? <laughs> like, what do I owe this app? What do I, like, why am I doing this? If, do I want to be here? Great. Do I not really, but I feel like I'm supposed to, then this is your life. That's my attitude. That might not be the best approach, <laughs> but you don't, you don't owe anybody 
You don't owe that to anybody. So what do you want to do with your time in your life? That's what I would say. And how? I could be wrong. Anyway, <laughs> that's a good place to end. So thank you very much. It was nice talking with you. Yeah.